And welcome to today's Life Today. I have a feeling that this next hour is going to be one of the most provocative hours you've ever heard in Christian talk radio. And I'm hoping it sets you off your seat by the time we're done. Because I believe that we are in a time where we need reformation. And the way we're going to gain reformation is to have information that helps direct us towards that. And when I saw the book that we're going to talk about today, Frank Viola and George Barna's Pagan Christianity, I knew that I had to have these gentlemen on the show. And I am beside myself now, being beside myself, knowing that they've joined me. Frank Viola, thank you so much, sir, for taking time out of your busy, busy world. And then uh, George Barna, thank you as well, sir. I, I, you uh, are just a phenomenon in our helping us with information statistics and things that uh, just really help us to get an eye of what's going on thank you george well thanks for the opportunity to share some things with you well gentlemen uh this book knocked my socks off um it is a book that i can say influences me on a regular basis as i continue to look through it with the information that you you put into it but i have to ask frank i have to ask why why pagan christianity as a title well, I guess the first reason uh, is that I'm just stark raving mad and out of my mind. <laughs> uh, but other than that, the book is designed to cause people to stop and think and uh, ask the question, what on earth is this book about? Mm. And uh, hopefully to open it up and read it. But we are essentially saying that a lot of what we do in the church today, the Christian church is not rooted in the New Testament. It actually comes from Greco-Roman culture, which we refer to as pagan. Yeah, and we'll get into more details after we take this short break. Unfortunately, my first segment is usually very short, and we'll get into a lot of details in this next hour as we visit together. Frank Viola and George Barna are my guests. The book is called Pagan Christianity. It's put out by Barna Books, and we'll learn some more right after this short break. Stay with us, friends. Life today, it's going to be hot, it's going to be provocative, and you'll want to tell a friend to tune in. Welcome to today's Life Today again. I'm very excited to have with me Frank Viola and George Barna in an amazing book called Pagan Christianity, a book that I fell in love with because, well, Frank and, and George, my big thing right now is, is understanding what Reformation needs to look like in this day and age and getting back to what real church is supposed to be all about. And I guess, Frank, that's the biggest reason why I fell in with, love with what you wrote in here. Uh, because it's everything that I thought it should be in terms of what where we should be as the body of Christ and how we practice what we do. I appreciate the kind words. You know, uh, when you're getting hate mail from Quakers, you know that <laughs> your book is making people angry. So it's nice to hear that uh, folks like yourself are really uh, receiving it well. Well, George, as, as you look at statistics, I know that we, you compile statistics for everything under the sun when it comes to specific issues in faith. And some of the numbers that I saw about real Christianity versus religiosity are, are, are alarming to me. Well, it is pretty staggering. And I think that's why right now we're really in full time period in the life of the Church, where more and more people are trying to figure out how they can have an authentic experience with God. They don't want to relate to institutions, they want to go right to God, which oddly enough is what the Reformation originally was about anyway. Yeah. And over the last, you know, however many centuries, you know, 15 centuries, whatever, uh, five, six centuries, we've kind of lost sight of the fact that Jesus died so that we don't need intermediaries, we don't need institutions, we don't right. need routines. We just need to get in touch with God and, and make Him everything in our lives. Well, I'd say it this way. Everybody needs to go back and read Hebrews. <laughs> I mean, if, read the book of Hebrews, and it, it, it lays down Christ right. being our high priest and, and some of the things that we've taken and tried to turn into some kind of an ordination for uh, a mediator that we don't need anymore. And, I, I, you know, I'm, I know I'm offending some of my friends listening out there. Too bad. I, I'm going to be just straightforward and blunt about this because I am sick and tired and angry with the way church is being done these days. It's a circus anymore. It's not church. Well, and to me, really, uh, the thing that attracted me to the book, Frank had written this book and, and self-published it. And after I wrote the book Revolution, uh, one of the people who read Re Revolution said, boy, you got to read this book, Pagan Christianity. 
So I got a copy of it and read it. I was blown away by it. It, mm. it was exactly the book that I had been looking for while I was writing Revolution, because I thought, man, I, I wonder where all this stuff comes from, because as I've been studying the Scripture for the last few years, trying to figure out, is this revolution biblically valid, I, I couldn't find so many of the things that we do in conventional churches anywhere in Scripture. Amen. You know? And so, you know, reading the book, uh, you know, it, it opened my eyes, and it just reestablished in my own mind and heart Man, we have been given so much freedom in Christ, and we've, in many ways, chosen to put ourselves back in mm. in chains. Yeah. yeah, and we got to get free from that. Well, that's what I'm hoping. By the time we get to five o'clock, because I only have an hour with you guys, and I'm blessed to be able to have that. I think there's some very important fundamentals that we need to address uh, in this in this hour to get people to wake up and go back to their churches and to their pastors and to the leadership and say, hey, you know what? I listened to that Life Today show, and he drove me nuts with what he said. <laughs> well, you're driving me nuts, I can tell you that. I'm not sure that has anything to do with You're a very radical show. person. I'm, I'm scared, actually. <laughs> oh, well, well, see, I've been involved in several churches that I've been kicked out of because I went and looked at the scriptures. I don't doubt that. <laughs> okay? And I, I, my, my thing is, Frank, I look at the Bible, and the Bible says, you know, Matthew 25 says we're supposed to be doing this, this, and this in the church. I look at the pastor, and I say, um, so why are we excluding this from the body of Christ? Yeah. And, and they say, oh, yeah. get out. You, you're done. Leave now. I don't need you. You're aggravating me. Go away. Well, you know, I think that's the story of many Christians in the sense that, and I put myself in this position, we have raised questions that ought not to be raised. And this is what we're trying to do in the book. We're trying to address issues that for so long have not been addressed, or if they have been, they've been addressed in some obscure books that nobody knows about, or they have been addressed by books that have been burned. Mm -hmm. uh, and so consequently, you know, the Lord's people are not stupid. Uh, yes, we are sheep, but we do have an indwelling Lord, and we have spiritual instincts. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons why there are so many Christians, uh, I'd say a mass exodus, who are leaving the institutional church in pursuit of something that is more authentic, as George was saying. Absolutely. Um, I like what Reggie McNeil said. He said a growing number of people are leaving the institutional church for a new reason. They're not leaving because they have lost their faith. They're leaving the church to preserve their faith. I think that is arresting as well as true. Well, some of the things that you share, Frank, in this volume should be arresting to some people out there and give people pause to think about the, the reality or the practicality of how we do church today uh, in light of some of the silliness that goes on. And, and I'm not trying to be mean-spirited when I say that. I'm saying that because as a, as a concerned brother in Christ, I want to see the body of Christ increase on a, on a regular basis right. with methodology that makes sense. Instead, right. I, I see pastors coming at us, we got this here building program, and we're going to build us this giant mega church which holds 80,000 people in it because, you know, we want to be the biggest population in our city. Oh, my word. Back after this as we continue this conversation with Frank Viola and George Bonner. 21 minutes, almost 22 minutes after the hour of 4 o'clock. Very jazzed to have Frank Viola and George Barna on with me. This amazing book called Pagan Christianity. Um, I have to say, friends, it's a home run. It's an absolute home run. And, and maybe because I'm a little tainted. I don't know. <laughs> but that's okay. Frank, uh, the, the, first, the way this book opens up about the church building, inheriting an edifice complex, I, just, I fell in love with that right away just because uh, I've always wondered, and you did some fabulous research here, that both of you guys are really involved with this in terms of giving us information as to a history that and I don't want to sound cruel when I say this, but there's something smelly about all this. I would absolutely agree with you that the history behind the church building is fascinating to me because it explains why we call a building a church. Mm -hmm. It explains why many Christians uh, view the building to be sacred. Not a few pastors, even in the Protestant church, say, isn't it good to be in the house of God today? Exactly. Uh, the sanctuary of the Lord. It's also, too, the architecture of the building. Uh, we rarely question why it is that there's a platform wherein the clergy sits and stands. Why is it that we're all arranged in pews and looking into one direction, uh -huh. uh, which renders us passive, muted spectators for the majority of the service, wherein we are becoming neck experts in inspecting the neck of the person in, in front of us? Yep. 
And then, of course, and George is an expert on this, the enormously obscene amount of money that we Christians spend every year on maintenance mm-hmm. and on the, the renting and purchasing of these buildings. And when you compare that over against the fact that the early Christians did not see a building as being sacred, uh, they did not see the building as being the church, they saw themselves together collectively as being the church, as being the sacred space of God. Mm-hmm. And uh, for 300 years they survived just fine without church buildings. I, I received an email recently where someone said in frustration that their church has $145,000 saved in an account to purchase a new building. They only have $3,000 in their relief fund to help the needy. Yay. And so we ought to step back and ask ourselves, is this what Jesus Christ had in mind? Absolutely. Now, George, I wasn't too far off the mark with my comment as we went to the break, you know, in terms of what I see people trying to, to accomplish in, church of, in terms of church building projects, right? Yeah, I mean, when we evaluate that every year, currently we're estimating that there's roughly in the neighborhood of 3 to $5 billion, with a B, 3 to $5 billion worth of construction going on for churches at the moment. Hmm. And, uh, you know, when you put together all the money that we spend on new buildings, on building maintenance, and then on church staff, it consumes in excess of 80% of the money that gets raised allegedly from ministry. Hmm. And, you know, you got to ask yourself a very simple question. What did Jesus die for? And, and you have to come to the conclusion Jesus didn't die hmm. for building programs. He didn't die to fill church auditoriums. Wow. You know, you got to look at the fact that he died, that people's lives would be changed, utterly transformed. And as you study how transformation works, you find out that it's by one individual loving another person into God's presence. Amen. And, and together being there in God's presence and being changed by God. So I think we've, with good intention, nevertheless lost our way over the long period of time. And here's an irony for you. I do a thing every week called Church of the Week, we can, so we can honor churches who are sharing the Word of God. I had a house church on one week for Church of the Week. I got the most hate mail I ever got in my life for. <laughs> you know, I mean, personal experience, we had been attending a uh, conventional church uh, here in our community for quite a while, and uh, through a series of circumstances, we wound up starting a house church. And uh, after, I don't know, six, eight months, you know, we're going back to the pastoral staff, and they were all upset and and whatnot. And uh, the pastor, and this was one of the larger churches in the county, preached a sermon saying, boy, if you think that there's any way that you can connect with God or that you're actually part of a, a legitimate church by meeting in somebody's living room, you are absolutely incorrect. That is unbiblical. It's, it's inappropriate. <laughs> And the guy just went on, you know, for his normal 45 minutes chastising anybody who would dare to go back to the Acts model, Mm -hmm. which was the church meeting in homes and and not worrying about anything but Jesus. But see, Frank, Frank, in the book, and I love the way you bring this up, the word ecclesia. Uh, anybody who has any inkling of Greek, and of course, I'm I'm not a Greek scholar by any means. I'm just a layman, but I know what that word means, and it has nothing to do with the building. It has to do with the body. Yet we see historically that uh, the, uh, even some of our church fathers tried to attach the building to it, as opposed to it was something. Absolutely, and I have often said that if we can make this one simple adjustment, that the Christian faith would be revolutionized in many ways, and that is if we can remove from our vocabulary calling a building, calling a denomination, calling a service, a religious service, a church. Calling a building a church is like calling your wife a skyscraper. It absolutely runs contrary to the mindset of Jesus Christ, the apostles, the New Testament, what it envisions for the church. And this is not semantics only. It's a mindset we have. When you use the word church, this is what pops into people's heads. You know, a pastor, pews, a building, a steeple, Mm -hmm. and one hour or two hours on Sunday morning, and that's church. And uh, this is very far removed from the New Testament concept and in the mind of God. Church is the community in which we live our Christian life. And God designed every Christian to be part of an authentic community of believers that shares their life together, that enthrones Jesus Christ as head, that expresses Him together in their lives and in their meetings, where He is the active, functioning 
head of that church. Yeah. This culture, this country's culture, is so attached to buildings as being church and not the body of Christ. I wanted to make that distinction right off the get-go, and we're going to get into some of the other things that you talk about, because you get into some real doozies when you when you put this together. And and to me, it was like, oh, I, I want to hug this man. And, and uh, if I ever see you, Frank, that's the first thing I'm going to do, brother. I am drowning in the butter right now, <laughs> my friend. We'll take a quick break, and we'll continue. In fact, uh, friends, we'll talk about the order of worship next for just a few seconds. And whoo, wait till we come back, folks. I'm telling you, this is a great book, and everybody should ought to have a copy of it. I'll tell you how after we come back for the break. 34 minutes after the hour, 4 o'clock. Very excited to have Frank Viola with me and George Barna. And gentlemen, thank you once again for being with me on the show. Uh, just there's so many things to cover in so little time. <laughs> But real quick, the order of worship, one of the things that I, f I found very interesting is, uh, Frank, that you, you cover all the specifics of of the Protestant order of worship, and, and you did a, a, some really nice research on that. Talk about that with, uh, to our listeners. Well, the, the Protestant order of worship essentially is the same in whichever denomination or Protestant expression you go to with minor adjustments. It's the same liturgy. You begin with singing, worship led by a worship team, etc., choir or a, a worship leader. Uh, you have the offertory, uh, and then you have maybe special singing, and then uh, the high point of the meeting is when the pastor preaches his sermon. Mm -hmm. And when we trace this in history, we see the development. And it's fascinating because it really began with the Catholic Mass, then moved on to the Protestant Reformation, uh, mostly under Calvin and Luther, and then it made some headway into the frontier revivalist, the, the Pentecostal movement, the Methodist movement. This is where you got your altar call from, right. your sinner's prayer. Frankly, I don't find that anywhere in the Bible either. Well, you don't find it in the Bible, and what you do find in the New Testament is a meeting, a gathering of the saints that's very different. Very. And one of the hallmarks is that every member is functioning, and that Jesus Christ is the living, breathing, active head of that gathering. He's directing what happens. Mm -hmm. All believers have the freedom to share. Uh, all believers have the freedom to function, and uh, this is the true meaning of the priesthood of all believers. Now, I know I, I've gone to uh, recently some home church services where that takes place. I'm seeing a revival of that, and I was very intrigued by it because everybody got to participate and uh, share their faith, and, and, and uh, we, we had conversation with each other while we worshipped a little bit, and yeah. we, we slipped in and out of worship and, and had more conversation. And when we were, I was full when I got done. It was, it was yeah. a, a fabulous feeling. Absolutely. We have a spiritual instinct to receive spiritually ministry from our brothers and sisters. We also have a great need to give to others what God has put in us. And when we are rendered as a pillar of salt, when we come together as believers in a, in a corporate meeting and we're not allowed to say anything, then we are violating our spiritual instincts. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, many Christians have admitted this, that they're forward, and they don't even remember what the sermon was about. But if you're in a meeting where everyone is sharing, and it's living, and it's breathing, and it's edifying, and you're sharing yourself, you not only remember that, but you see the Lord. Amen. And, and George, would you say that in the information that you've put together that we're seeing a trend towards more people wanting a sort of a house church kind of a format as opposed to uh, the sacred cow that we have right now? Yeah, not only are they wanting it, we're finding that enormous numbers of people are experimenting with it right now, which of course is one of the first steps toward there being a massive shift in terms of behavior should people find that form to be something that works for them. Hmm. The studies that we've been doing where we look at leadership, we look at community, we look at discipleship, uh, we, we look at the worship experience, and compare people in-house churches to those who are in conventional churches, we're finding that there are much higher percentages of people in the house churches who are saying it, it really is fulfilling and satisfying as opposed to the people who are in conventional churches. Yeah. So I, th yeah, I think we're in the midst of a, a major shift phase right now, and frankly, Ted, part of this comes back to something that we discovered as, as I was doing the research for Revolution, which was as you look at the, the movements that leave a lasting effect on the planet, whether they're revolutions or movements, whatever you want to call them, one of the, the characteristics that they tend to have in common is inefficiency. Now, inefficiency means that there's not an overbearing tendency to try to control what everybody does. Mm. And then if you look at conventional churches, not in all cases, but 
generally speaking, what you find is there is a desire to have everything in its place, to have everything run smoothly, for everything to be very efficient. Mm. And the reality is, the way that the Holy Spirit appears to work is not always terribly efficient, because right. the Holy Spirit's working in and through people. Right. And so it's imperfect vessels that the Spirit is working with, and I think one of the beauties of some of the alternative models to the Church, some of the original models, such as house churches, uh, is that it gives people the opportunity to experience God how He wants them to experience Him, as opposed to what's been preordained or predefined yeah. by the leaders of an organization. Well, the, what we're going to do in the next segment, Frank, is we're going to give you your wish about pastors. And then ah. our last segment, we're going to talk about Reformation and all, because I've only got two more segments with you guys. So let's get ready to unload the cannon on this next one. And maybe that's not a pun, exactly. So back after this as we continue, it's live today. My very special guests are Frank Viola and George Barna. The book is called Pagan Christianity, put out by Barna Books. We'll tell you how you can have a copy if you'll stay with us as we continue life today on 100.7 KJFT. Coming up on 43 minutes after the hour of 4 o'clock, Frank Viola and George Barna are my guests. And the book is called Pagan Christianity. It's put out by Barna Books. And before we get done with the show today, we will uh, give you an opportunity to own a copy of this. I have some copies to give away later on. But I've only got two more segments with these gentlemen, and I want to focus in on two particular issues. Uh, Frank, first of all, the pastor. Now, I know this is going to sound like I'm, I'm beating up on pastors everywhere. I don't want that to come off that way because I believe that uh, the pastoral person is a person of who should be uh, have a great function in the in the church and in the body of Christ. But you make some very profound points in your your chapter chapter five. The pastor obstacle to every member functioning, and I think that's why it's such an important chapter because of the every member functioning part of it. But this is the other thing too is that. Uh, the word pastors appears in the in the Bible, but not the way we think it's supposed to be, right? Right, right. absolutely. Well, let me say this to you, and I echo your sentiments. Uh, I have great love and respect for pastors. I have friends who are pastors, and they are great men, and I, I honor them highly. What we are doing in the book is we are challenging the modern office of pastor in its present form, mm -hmm. and we're challenging it on the grounds of the New Testament and church history. Basically, the present role of the pastor as we know it today was an invention of the Reformation. Yes. The modern pastor office, in effect, is really a Reformed Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. And let me just say this to your audience in the way of a challenge. Pick up your New Testament and look for this man. Show me a man in the New Testament who preaches to the same congregation week after week, month after month, year after year. Yep. Show me a man in the New Testament who is called the head of the church. Show me a man in the New Testament that makes the decisions for a local church. Show me a man in the New Testament that represents the church in the world, that blesses civic events, that marries the living, and buries the dead. And if you can find that man in the New Testament who fits all of those descriptions, then George Barna will give you five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it! Now, George, you you give some great statistics here about how the pastor damages himself. Let's talk about some of those a little bit. Uh, the, these these are the, the, uh, amazing to me. Um, that there's so much pressure put on that man and the role that he's put in based on what we think he's supposed to be. Well, it's, it's a very difficult situation. Like Frank, I, I don't want to just bag on pastors. No. They're, they're in a very, very difficult situation. Right. Because you look at how they get to that place. First of all, we've got a religious system that set them up for failure, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They go through a system of education where they're not really trained to do the 16 primary functions that the typical congregation expects them to excel at. Right. They get into that situation, and nobody can have all of the gifts and capabilities that you would need to satisfy that, that range of expectations. Wow. Exactly. And, you know, what do they gravitate to doing? The thing that God gifted them to do. Normally, what we find as, as we test pastors in terms of their gifting is that they are gifted uh, teachers, mm -hmm. particularly of Scripture. And yet, the only way that they can get the platform to do mm -hmm. that 
is to pretend that they're a leader, to pretend that they can do all these other things so that they actually do get to do what they do best. But it's, it's just an untenable situation for most pastors, and consequently it has some very negative effects on congregants. That's not to say that pastors don't do some great and wonderful things in people's lives, but I think the point is that if they were freed up the way that Christ intended them to be freed up, to use the gifts that he invested in them, they could do even greater things than they're able to do in the current system. Now, gentlemen, right. I'm going to say something, and you correct me if I'm wrong. I think what's wrong in the church of America particularly is that we set up our pastors to be God. Go ahead and correct them, George. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm still trying to come up with the 500000 bucks you uh, gave me to. Here. Well, you don't have to worry because nobody's going to find that man. In the yeah, well, exactly. True. There that's you true. go. But, uh, but am, I, am I off the mark? Because that's the impression that I get listening to some of my friends talk about their pastor. I mean, they, they flat up almost want to drop through their knees and worship this fella. And, and it's nuts to me that we put anybody in that kind of position to begin with because that's not his job. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly not a biblical prescription for how it is that we're supposed to honor the true God. Mm. Uh, you, you know, when you look at what the Church was called to be, it, it just doesn't bear much resemblance to what we've made it to be. And I think that's one of the key points of the book, mm -hmm. is that we have to go back and distinguish what is man-made and what is God-ordained. Right. And there's such a big gap. It is, and if you look at Scripture, I know that uh, Paul talks about several offices that need to be filled when it comes to helping the body of Christ, and uh, pastor's only one of several. Oh, absolutely. And so absolutely. It's, it, it seems to make sense to me that if we're, if we're going to use the correct model, that is the New Testament in terms of how we work the body of Christ, then we need to go back and reexamine why do we do it the way we do right now. Right. And, that's and, and that's what makes it nuts to me that we... we we're, we're being screwy about this whole thing, and, and, and maybe that's why I'm so passionate about talking about it, and I get so excited and so aggravated at the same time. Well, and I, you know, from my experience in working with pastors and churches all over the world, when, when I talk about these things, people get very rigid mm -hmm. in terms of their body, because this, this is such a shocking thought that what we've committed ourselves to might not be what we ought to be committing ourselves to. It's really difficult to make radical change, but we got to understand we've been given a document by God himself that tells us what the church is to be. Exactly. Well, what I've got is one more segment with you, and I want to talk about Reformation, what you guys think Reformation should look like, and how do we get there, okay? And I know, that George, you've got a book called Revolution, which kind of lays it out a little bit, but Frank, I want to hear your ideas as well, okay? So when we come back from this last final segment that we have together, we'll continue talking about Frank and George's book called Pagan Christianity, put out by Barna Books, and yeah, we'll tell you how you can get one. Stay with us, friends. We're going to continue live today, right after this short break. Coming up on 53 minutes after 4 o'clock, our final segment with Frank and George. And gentlemen, let me say one more time how grateful I've been for just the, the little time we've had together. I, I'd love to have you back later on, and we'll talk about why that's, uh, that should happen in a little bit. But George, I want you to go first because you wrote Revolution, and I think kindred spirits are here in the fact that I hear God talking to me all the time about being the... The, the spokesperson, if you will, of getting Reformation started here in Southern Colorado. Not that I want to be, you know, Joan of Arc or anything, but or Martin Luther for that matter, but um, because I couldn't stand a diet of Wyoming's, but that, that's a joke. Never mind. Uh, George, <laughs> George, tell me, why do you believe that Reformation is necessary? Well, if you look at the spiritual character of the American people, it's true that when you compare us to other nations on earth, the research shows that we are one of the most, if not the most, religious societies on the planet. Mm -hmm. However, Jesus didn't die for religion. Amen. The whole idea here is that we are supposed to be in the process of being transformed through the intimacy that we have with Christ. Amen. Yeah. The reality is that in the United States, we are a nation of biblically illiterate people. We're a nation where within the Church, less than one out of every ten born-again Christians has a biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. We're a nation of people where when most people go to uh, worship services on any given weekend, they're going primarily for themselves, not to benefit God. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you go on through all the statistics I could recite, and the reality is we've completely lost sight of what life is all about. Mm -hmm. 
we've been so distracted by all the things that Satan has thrown in our way that we have come to believe that life is about us. Yeah. What we can get, what we can do, how we feel, what right. we want, how we can be satisfied. In reality, as you read God's Word, you come to understand that's not it at all. Amen. We're here for one reason, and that is to have the privilege of knowing God through Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in a, a very incredibly special and supernatural and intimate way. Mm-hmm. And to take that relationship and run with it in the sense that we see ourselves here to worship Him, to serve Him, to love Him, and to obey Him. Amen. Nothing more, nothing less. That's awesome. Well said, sir. Frank? I just want to uh, underline the fact that George has done some amazing research on the concept of revolution and how it pertains to what's happening today in the Christian landscape, and I would really exhort your listeners to get his book, Revolution. It's actually the prequel to pagan Christianity. They go together. Uh, Just a few observations. The first Reformation under Luther and Calvin and so forth made church life acceptable outside of Rome, But the present revolution is making church life outside of both Protestantism and Roman Catholicism acceptable. Mm. The First Reformation, I think, was uh, about the recovery of the Bible, but the present revolution is about the recovery of the Bride of Christ and the Body of Christ being set free from religious tradition. And finally, the First Reformation was about the priesthood of every believer, uh, wherein we don't need a clergy to absolve us from our sins. But the present revolution is about the priesthood of all believers, wherein every member of the body of Christ is a functioning member of Jesus Christ that comes together in a meeting and ministers as a priest Amen. without a clergy. And I think those uh, three points are at least some of the distinctions between the First Reformation and the present revolution. It's a very exciting time to live in. Well, I I just think it's so necessary to get back to what Scripture says to us in terms of how to go about how we live in this present world. We've gotten so caught up in religion that we think religion is Christianity. It's not. And and that's what alarms me. That's what... That's why I, I, I've been so hot under the collar about this and, and to the point of almost being angry all the time because people that I talk to are satisfied with religion. Right. You know, Ted, uh, <laughs> one scholar said it this way, in the process of replacing the old religions, Christianity became a religion. Mm-hmm. And it's true. We we take the things that we do, we have 18 bajillion different denominations now because no one is satisfied with, oh, well, you're not doing this, so I'm going to go off and create my own. Right. And it's like, you know, it's, hi, it's the do-it-yourself religion show. Hello, welcome to my version of it. Come on down now. Come on. That's not what Christianity <laughs> says we're supposed to be about. We're supposed to be the body of Christ. And we're busy fighting with each other as if, you know, that's, that's unity. <laughs> it's pathetic. And I'm not saying it's all destroyed, but because I, I know there's core people out there who feel just like you and I and George, and, and there's others out there who are saying, no, 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 there's something coming that we've got to be involved with that is steeped from the Holy Spirit and, and speaking into the center of our hearts that says, show us Jesus, please. Amen. That's right. Well, and Ted, one of the things that intrigued me as I was researching revolution is Jesus' standard for evaluation. When we did research among conventional churches across the country a couple of years ago, we found out that churches have five things that they gauge as being success. Mm. You know, it, it's it's attendance, it's buildings, it's cash, mm. it's the number of programs and the number of staff people. Yeah. And if those things are growing, they say we're successful. Jesus didn't die for any of that. No. Right. You know, what he said is, show me the fruit. And the fruit to him was transform lives who are in community to honor and worship Him. Mm. That's what the church has to become. Well, Frank, with your permission, there's a couple of chapters that I'm going to go after in the next hour with my listeners, and I know that you've got to go, but I hope that I can have your blessing to talk about tithing and about clothing and about a few other things that you have in your book, because what I saw made me so impassioned that I know that I've got to continue to share it. So with your blessing, may I? 
Uh, I will absolve you of all of your <laughs> sins, and I will give you my blessing, my son. <laughs> thank you, Father. Uh, <laughs> gentlemen, it has been an absolute delight, and thank you so much for the hour. Great to be with you. Thank you. God bless you both. Take care.